It's time for the Phil Ferguson Show. Mi chiamo Phil Ferguson. Benvenuti il mio podcast. My name is Phil Ferguson and welcome to my podcast. Get a little Italian practice in when I can. Still having great fun with that, by the way. Now I'm actually learning grammar and there is a possibility that I now know more Italian grammar than English grammar because in high school and middle school, I was awful. Absolutely awful. Um, but you know, we live, we learn, we find new things to uh, study. So keep doing that. And maybe someday, if things go well with coronavirus, I can travel to Italy again. But 2021, in the fall, I had my hopes up. But I don't know. It's still looking dicey. Uh, but maybe. Maybe things turn around. Uh, I know I'm definitely not going to India. I don't know if you've heard the tragic news out of India lately. Um, their numbers of COVID... Uh, Known COVID cases is now challenging the really high numbers we had around Christmas time for the United States, um, but they aren't testing anywhere as high a percentage of the population as we have done and as we do, and so it's believed that it could be several times worse uh, than in the United States, not just in uh, numbers, but percentages. So, yeah. Boy, that's a bummer. That That's that's really not cool. All right, before I completely bring us all down, I, I wanted to talk about something that is actually in one of my upcoming segments. And I happen to mention the five-year return of the S&P 500, which, of course, you can find on Wikipedia, which is one of the reasons I use this. The five-year return is 15.22% per year. And the historical norm is 10, plus or minus 1% maybe nine, maybe 11, depending on how you count it, how you look at it, what dates you measure from, all those things. I think over the last uh, 49 years from 1970, the average return is around 10.6. So that's almost 50, 50, uh, 50 years because we're going to end at 2020. So, you know, that's a good reference point. So the S&P 500 has done better than its long-term average by a considerable margin in the last five years. But what does one do with that information? Uh, because if you look back over time, as an example, uh, 2013, the five-year return was almost 18%, and the next year made a 14% return. So if you had taken your money out, you would have missed that. Uh, if I go back in time, uh, this is a kind of a tricky one, 1995, the five-year return was 16.6, and the next year was 23%, and the next year was 33%, and the next year was 29%, and the next year was 21%. So there's a string that uh, clearly got a little out of hand in the late 90s with the dot-com boom, but when does it get out of hand? Does it get out of hand when the average return is 15% per year or 20% per year? Um, let's see, let's go back further in time. Uh, 1984, the five-year average was uh, 14.8. And the next year, 1985, the market went up 32%. Uh, and then 1905, 16, and then uh, 32% again in 1989. So it's hard to know, right? So th that information can't guide you. So I just wanted to make sure and kind of give that little shout out to, to data that uh, it's there's a lot of data you can collect. There's a lot of data you can create, but what do you do with it? And uh, something that has come up, and I think I mentioned it a few shows ago, is that TD Ameritrade, the platform that I use for my clients, does not have an automatic way to calculate your return for the year. And for the most part, 
I am delighted that they don't do that. Uh, because what are you going to do with that information? Are you going to pull out of the market? Are you going to add money to the market? Uh, generally, I like the idea of a of a plan. And the plan can have features where it grows and changes and morphs over time. And, of course, you get more and more conservative as you get closer to retirement. Should you make big changes based on a one-year market fluctuation? Maybe. Maybe not. It's It's tough to know. The other thing I thought of is just for fun, uh, I was looking at stocks in 1999 because that was that was the dot com thing. And one of the things that people tend to forget is that the stocks that are the hottest now may or may not be the hottest in the future. It's it's uh, something we assign a continuation. And uh, there's probably some logical fallacy about that, but a stock that's doing well is going to continue doing well. And my joke answer is until it doesn't. And I've also done the example where you want to buy a sweater that's $100 in the store, but you don't want to spend $100. So you say, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. And I come back. And a year later, it's 200 Now you're really tempted. You come back another year, it's 500 And now you buy it. Almost nobody <laughs> that struggled with a purchase price of $100 for a sweater will now be more excited to buy that sweater for $500 at some point in the future. But with stocks, it's different. It fucks with your mind. You, you look at a stock that's gone up a thousand percent. You're like, oh my God, I wish I bought it before it went up, of course, but now I, I can buy it now. And when it goes up another thousand percent, I'll be in the right place. Really big, successful stocks that have made a lot of money over the last five, 10, 15, 20 years. Sometimes they continue on for years. Sometimes they're a, a modest winner. Sometimes they make market matching or beating returns. Most of the time, uh, I'm guessing that they underperform just because that's kind of how historical data works. Uh, but sometimes they just don't do well at all. So I picked a couple from 1999, 2000 that were just on fire. And the first one here, you're probably not surprised, uh, General Electric. Uh, General Electric back in October of 2000, was $59.44, and right now it is $13.93, almost $14, and a few weeks ago it was, well, look at this, $6.66. What does that tell you? I don't know what it tells you. Just It's just a price. Uh, so there's a stock that was 60, and now it's below 15, so it's lost 75% of its value over the last 20, 21 years. You, you didn't make money. Matter of fact, you just kept losing, 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 and not only did you lose 75%, but you didn't make money that you could have made, even if it was only just 10% per year during that time frame as a approximate long-term return. Another one, and I've talked about this in the past, I, this was kind of a, 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 an important moment for me. I remember talking to my dad back in um, the late 90s, early 2000, about buying Cisco stock, Cisco Systems stock. And his rationale was pretty sound. They were in the internet business. They did servers and switches. They were number one in a lot of categories. And the internet's going to be huge and everything's going to change. And Cisco is in the right place. And so the philosophy was that no price is too high for a stock like that. Well, its peak was, well, if I can move this very, very small steps here, um, there we go. 65 bucks, give or take. Maybe a little. Oh, there's $75. It peaked at $75. And then two years later, in 2002, it was $10. So if you bought at the peak, 75 thinking no price is too high, you could look back on that in time and, and think that you might have been wrong. Uh, it went from $75 to $10. Now, of course, I think along the way somewhere, it's been giving dividends. So you've gotten that. The price for Cisco stock today is $51, $52 compared to the 60s and 70s in 1999-2000. And of course, I can do this all day with different stocks. And you might say, and you'd be right to say, Phil, you are cherry picking the losers. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the point of what I'm doing here. And, and this is the risk of individual stocks. This is the risk of thinking that because your stock has done magical things in the last five or 10 years, that it will continue to do those magical things. 
Well, some of the really biggest companies, if they grew at the rate that they grew for the last 10 or 15 or 20 years, could be bigger than the U.S. economy. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Uh, often when you look at the best performing stocks for five or 10 years, you find out that they're a company that probably was really small, might have gone bankrupt, had terrible problems. The price of the stock often is a dollar or less. And part of that reason is because when you have a stock that's worth a dollar or a company that's worth almost nothing, if it becomes worth something, <laughs> the rate of return can become enormous. And no, I'm not suggesting that you go out and buy a bunch of penny stocks. But what I'm getting to is that you may not know which way the future is going to go. You may not know. You don't know. (laughs) You don't know if it's going to be the companies that have won in the last five years are going to continue to win. You don't know if it's going to be a handful of stocks. And how do you find that handful of small stocks? Because a lot of small stocks, a lot of penny stocks, they call them, uh, traded on what's known as the pink sheets. uh, A lot of them do go broke. So how do you pick the right one? The only way I know of to own every single hot stock, guaranteed success, you will own every single hot stock, is to own the entire U.S. stock market. Now, you can do that simply with the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index, which I think the minimum to get in is $3,000. And a lot of times I get people asking me, I only have $3,000 or $5,000 or $10,000 or $20,000. And I'll say, get the total stock market index from Vanguard. You could also get the total world index. I'd be fine with that. And you're going to own all the stocks. And they say, well, I I hear you talking about your plan and you've got all these different investments and all these different funds. And that can be work to maintain that, track that, know what you're doing, figuring out when and what to sell. It can take work. And if you only have three or $5,000, first of all, you can't buy all those funds because a lot of them have a three thousand dollar entry so if i'm recommending 15 funds obviously you have to have forty five thousand to even fantasize doing it and if you want to have different ratios uh you're going to need one to 150 maybe maybe even two hundred thousand to pull it off and like i've said before if you have three thousand dollars the problem for you is not finding the perfect investment the problem for you is that you have three thousand dollars and If you're 18 or 20 or 25, 30, okay, that's cool. It's not a lot of money, but you know, you've got to work on saving more. If you're 55 or 60, it's a problem. It's a problem if you want to retire and you haven't started saving yet. And one of the temptations that people will have is, um, I don't know, I don't know what to call it, but but the idea that I'm never going to have enough doing something like Phil says. So I'm going to do something crazy. I'm going to do something that might hit the jackpot. And you could be 20 and thinking this. You could be 60 and thinking this. This is this humans do. And this is where I came up with the phrase that uh, think about someone that you know that's always trying to strike it rich. Did you notice? They're always trying. Because if it worked, they wouldn't have to keep trying. They would already be rich and they could stop. Because when you have a ton of money, why would you risk it all in one weird thing. It's the person that has very little money, doesn't understand the stock market, and or doesn't want to take the risks that they perceive often, not always, from their lack of understanding of how the stock market works. So just a couple of thoughts. Um, The one other thing I wanted to mention because it was a story in CNN, which was nice. A couple of episodes ago, I talked about SPACs, S-P-A-C, So uh, these are companies that don't do anything. Well, they do eventually, but they are aggregators of cash and they're a publicly traded stock that you can buy in a company that does nothing. I shit you not, this is the thing. And it's been very trendy, very hot, which is why I covered it. And we look, it looks like we might be turning a corner because in the last quarter, There was only five or six of these that were created where in some previous quarters, it's been 50 or more. And the the idea of the SPAC, again, as covered a few episodes ago, they pool together and collect a whole lot of money. They're a publicly traded stock. So they can then merge with a private company that's not publicly traded, merge and use 
the stock of the SPAC going forward. And so all of the cash from the SPAC goes to the company or the people that own the company that they're buying. And the people that sell or get the money uh, then get shares in the SPAC, which sometimes it'll even drop the name of the SPAC and just take the name of the company that they've bought. And so it's a very efficient way to do an initial public offering without doing an initial public offering. Uh, the one that I happen to know the most about was ChargePoint. ChargePoint does uh, high-speed DC fast chargers for electric cars. I'm not aware that they have anything to do with building equipment for Tesla, but they might. But they're rolling out their own nationwide network. And the business has grown like a weed. And their growth rate is limited only by cash. <laughs> because at cash and loans. And one of the ways to get a whole lot of new cash is to do an initial public offering. But that's complicated. And there's fees and commissions. And brokers can take a big chunk of that money to facilitate you going public. So the nice thing about an SPAC is that it can come in and what it did was it bought ChargePoint and all the money, whatever money SPAC had, goes to all the people who owned ChargePoint and they might keep some of the shares. Uh, but now it's a public company, poof, overnight that happened with ChargePoint. I think I have that story right. If I'm wrong, let me know because I do make mistakes. Uh, but that's a, a rarity. Because you can have an SPAC that does nothing and continues to do nothing because they can't find something to buy, something that they like. And the question is, while the SPAC is holding your money, they are not creating anything. They're not producing anything. They're not creating wealth. And so kind of in my mind, anyway, it's kind of like buying a cryptocurrency. The price of the shares for that SPAC may go up and they may go down. But at least in this case, they should be sitting on a big pile of cash because they've been selling shares and they have cash. So there's actually something to back up the company. But if they make a shitty investment, you probably have no control over that. So I guess I'm delighted that they've dramatically slowed down for now. Because of course, um, if there's only four or five or 10 diamonds in the rough every year, if there's 150 SPAC companies, they can't all buy winners. And how do you know what they're going to buy in advance? You don't. You can't. And so this makes uh, SPACs a clever thing for some people to dabble with. But for the average investor, stay the fuck away, uh, especially if the share price is worth more than the cash that they hold on hand. And even trading uh, below the cash they hold on hand, they may have expenses and the cash may shrink because they're not creating anything. So anyway, uh, coming up for the Investing Skeptically, I, got, I have a couple of segments that I pulled out of uh, a magazine that I get, and it's usually worthless, but it gave me a couple of topics this week to talk about. And then later, we're going to talk to Robin Blumner, and she works with the Center for Inquiry. And even now, I can't remember what her correct title is, partly because I really don't care about titles, but she's something like the CEO or Executive Director for the Center for Inquiry, and we talk about Robert Green Ingersoll, and I put a sample at the end of the last episode, and I think what I'm going to do is put a sample or two in this show for the breaks. Uh, I got a lot of positive emails uh, last time about using Ingersoll's stuff, uh, as published by CFI in 2004, and until they tell me differently, there are still CDs available. Hopefully, I have a link for you soon. But I'm going to put a couple of those in, and I might do it for a show or two. If everybody loves it, maybe I'll keep doing it, or maybe I'll go back to what I've been doing, and six months from now, I'll surprise you with another Robert Green Ingersoll nugget of knowledge. So then we're going to wrap up the introduction, and we're going to have a little break and get into more fun stuff in the show. On top of all the fun emails I get, I also get uh, stuff in snail mail, I guess we call it now. And here is a copy of the Financial Planning. I guess that's the name of the magazine. See, you hear that? Now, well, magazine paper pages. I was kind of hoping it made more rattly sounds, but it's actually in print. I have this here. And, and often they talk about 
all the great ways that insurance can make your life better and long-term care and a lot of the stuff that uh, I talk about not doing. Uh, But I found an article that was kind of interesting to me. So I figured if it's interesting to me, maybe it would be interesting to you. The title of this article is Grandma Wins Case Against J.P. Morgan and Grandsons. Huh? What do you think of that? Uh, Let's see here if I can uh, get this correct. The family that were involved here is the Schottensteins. Never heard of them. Uh, But apparently uh, they had a two two to two and a half billion dollar retail empire. I can only imagine how retail empires have done in the last five years. But uh, they owned stores like DSW, American Eagle Outfitters, American Signature Furniture, and many shopping centers, malls, properties, real estate, all kinds of things like that. Four brothers. One of them was married to the lady who's the grandma in the story, and he has since passed away. And the article said at some point they had, I think it was $2.7 billion. So she gets a fourth of that, something around $500 million. And maybe a little less because retail's been... Uh, doing poorly. So let's say she has $400 million. I, I think one can find a way to get by on that. Well, two of her grandsons were managing the money for her. And uh, a ar- arbitration award, uh, she has won $19 million from J.P. Morgan. Because J.P. Morgan profited from activities that were deemed inappropriate. I'm being uh, polite here because I don't want to have any troubles myself. Uh, And one of the defenses, the attorney, the defense attorney for the grandsons said as proof uh, that they weren't ripping her off, her portfolio actually went up by $30 million for the five years that they ran it. And you think to yourself, well, $30 million is a heck of a lot of money. You're right. It's a ginormous amount of money. We can only hope that we can see that someday. Uh, 30 million. But like I said, that's on maybe a 400 million to $500 million account. So if it's a 400 million, if it was a $300 million account, obviously that would be 10% growth. And on 400 million, uh, 7.5% growth. So, you know, that's not a lot. We're talking here about someone that made, I don't know, one and a half to 2% per year net on her portfolio for five years to get to that seven, seven and a half, ten percent 10% return uh, over five years when the grandsons were managing it. And over the last five years, the market's done pretty well. According to the uh, S&P 500 Wikipedia page, which I tell you about, you can go check there. The five-year average annualized return for the S&P 500 ending at the end of 2020 is about 15.2% per year. She didn't make that much money over five years. So it's curious. That would be something that would be alarming to me. Now, another thing that was very interesting is that the account uh, was non-discretionary. And so in case you didn't know, a discretionary account, the advisor where the broker can do whatever they want. A non-discretionary account, you have to have a written, probably written confirmation for everything that you're supposed to do in advance. So the grandsons could trade only if they suggested something to the grandma and got her approval that, yes, she wants them to buy that. And apparently they made more than 360 unauthorized trades. And you can think to yourself, How in the hell are they making unauthorized trades? Isn't someone watching the account? Well, they were able to produce uh, documentation showing that they had sent her all of the confirmations and she never said anything about it. Well, the funny thing is apparently they created, allegedly, allegedly, these two grandsons created fake email accounts for the grandmother on her behalf and sent the notices to that a fake email account that they created. So JP Morgan's protocol would check to see if something had been sent out and it was. 
but uh, grandma never got it because it was a fake account. So they created fake email accounts, sent her the information there. Uh, she still made money, like I said, of uh, 7 to 10% over five years, so 1.5% to 2% per year. And uh, this results in J.P. Morgan having to pay a fine of $19 million, which sounds like a lot, <laughs> and it's a lot, but... If this portfolio is worth three to five hundred million, that's a drop in the bucket for what she could have or might have lost. Um, they were selling all kinds of fun things, and I'm not going to go over all of them, but it's the it's the stuff we talk about on the show on a regular basis. Um, they had a one hundred and fifty million dollar purchase of derivatives known as auto callable structured notes. Okay, I don't know exactly what that means, but I'm guessing it's some kind of bonds that uh, pay <laughs> in certain conditions, but they're callable and they're probably created as, uh, oh, how do I want to say this? It, it's something that's created in such a way that the person writing the notes and the person that's getting paid a great big commission for selling the notes is likely to make far more money than the person who buys the notes. And it's something that if you've had full awareness and knowledge of what these things were, in your right mind, you would never fucking buy this stuff. I don't know that for a fact, but from what I've seen before, and, and that's how you can get to an account that just doesn't make money in a time period where the U.S. market makes 15% per year because the process is siphoning money out And one of the things when I see a lot of these things, we talked about universal life last week. We talk about private placement REITs. We've talked about master limited partnerships, all these different things. Generally, what they try to do is they don't really necessarily want you to lose money, but they want to make as much or more than you are making from your own money. So I thought that was a, an interesting story, maybe just a little news item uh, that J.P. Morgan has to cough up $19 million uh, from this uh, arbitration award. It wasn't even courts. That's a whole nother dilemma. We've had guests on talking about uh, investment arbitrations. But thought you find, find that interesting. J.P. Morgan pays $19 million. The Phil Ferguson Show is for educational purposes only. Nothing said on the show should be interpreted as personalized investment advice. Your investments should be based on your situation, and you should consult with your financial advisor before taking any action. The show may contain ads. These ads are placed into the show by the hosting company after I finish recording and editing. I have little control over the content of the ads, and you should not assume that I support their products or claims. If you choose to support the show via the new Patreon page, that support does not create an advisor-client relationship. I want to talk a minute about the investment industry. And it's one of those weird things, uh, for those of you who know the story, I, I maybe. Mean, those of you who don't know the story, I kind of started Polaris Financial Planning accidentally, which is bizarre to even think about. Uh, but years ago, 23, 25 years ago, I was simply helping friends by giving them suggestions at where they could invest and make more money and do better, trying to create a, a really favorable trade-off between volatility, aka risk, and your returns. And a couple of them said, hey, how can we pay you for your help? And I knew nothing. I was a complete noob. And I, I studied for the Series 7, which I couldn't take, and I've gone over that story before. Ended up taking the Series 65. And the big buzzkill, and the reason most people don't take the Series 65, uh, at least according to what I was told 23, 25 years ago, is that you have to act as a fiduciary. And I guess most people don't want to do that because it could put you in a a precarious legal position if you sell something knowing that it's shit and benefiting from that more than the client benefits from it. And so 
most brokers, most insurance people aren't Series 65. There's a bunch of different other numbers, but uh, Series 7 is the standard broker license. And you can do things and sell things that can make you or the company that you work for a lot, a lot of money. And there's all kinds of complicated ways that people can make money that you can't see. Uh, the result that you get is previously described dramatic underperformance or negative performance or just, uh, you know, poor, poor investments. And so it's not necessarily that you are choosing the wrong investments. You may be in a position where you've hired someone who is choosing bad investments for you. They might be great for them. Well, one of the things I, I don't know, I, I fret over, I worry over, I have nightmares about is that almost every year, uh, maybe it's every couple of years, there's new rules that I have to follow. And that's great. I, I'm all for the uh, regulation of the industry. And the sad thing is that I think there's enough regulation. There's just not enough people to implement or enforce the regulations and the industry, I think, uh, this is me saying it, a a as a whole, the industry is more interested in protecting their ass and, and not openness into how they're collecting money from you because it's kind of kind of hidden uh, in, a, in a dark box, just like one of the new things for uh, 401k accounts uh, will be proprietary funds, funds that aren't traded in the public. So when they tell you you made 7%, uh, okay, how, how do I check that? How do I judge that? What do I compare that to? I don't know. You just, they just told you you made 7%. So there's actually this article, and, and I did this uh, earlier segment here just a few minutes ago, again from the Financial Planning Magazine. Got two interesting things in this magazine. And this one is, it struck that thing that I have nightmares about, that really big investment firms are actually pushing for more regulation. Now, when I say more regulation, I mean more difficult things that one has to fill out and file and comply with. And uh, if you are an independent registered investment advisor like Polaris and I am, it becomes harder and harder every couple of years when new rules are added for me to comply with those rules. When I started 25 years ago, it took me a lot of effort to get uh, my filings done, my regulations done, all the documentation, all the paperwork, everything that I have to do. And every couple of years, there's more rules. There's more things that I have to comply with. And of course, as Polaris got bigger, I eventually got to the point where I thought I, w I felt compelled to, and I have now uh, a third party firm that specializes in making sure that I comply with all of the regulations. And that's great, but the amount of money I have to pay them every year seems to go up. I guess I should say doesn't seem to go up. It does go up. And I think it goes up at a very reasonable amount because every couple of years, there's more things that have to be filed. There's more documents that I have to do. And a lot of it just becomes busy work, kind of like uh, college you, you had to do certain things to get an A doesn't necessarily mean that they make sense or they benefit you in the long run. It's just something you have to do. And the things that I have to do are more and more every year. Well, this article is talking about as a strategy for the large firms to make this harder and harder and harder for little guys to do because so many advisors that work for, from the previous story, uh, JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley or John Hancock, TIAA Cref, wherever they want to go independent because they see a way to make money, maybe more money by providing a better investment. And one of the things that I do that it's, it's not unique, but it's probably only five or 10% of the industry does what I do where I get paid every year. You can walk away at any time. There's no hooks. There's no tricks. There's no kickbacks. There's no commissions. I get nothing from any source at all, except for the clients. And all the clients are free to walk away at any time and just leave me behind. So the industry doesn't like that because when advisors leave, 
And if an advisor has $50 million that they're helping manage and they, they leave and over the next couple of years, they're able to take 25 or 30 million with them or the, the incremental revenue that those clients might provide over the years, that, that leaves less money for the big companies. And it's becoming a trend in the business for more and more advisors to go independent and try to do things like I do. Some of them just get a Series 7 license and continue doing what I would consider materially suboptimal activities that they were doing for you before. And they're just, they're, they're on their own now. So more regulations don't necessarily do anything to protect against that. But what they do is they make it harder for an independent advisor, uh, a team of four or five people, or in my case, one person that I have to hire out more people, more compliance work, more, more funds that go out. And they, in this article, talk about they actually want to, the investment industry actually wants to make it all harder because they can have a team that does all the compliance. I can't have a team. Well, I guess I do have a team because I've hired one outside, but uh, it's an interesting trend in the market and something that actually does worry me a little bit that the market, the big players in the investment world are actually actively encouraging more regulation to make it harder to do the business because that creates a bigger moat for anyone to start and and get into the industry because 25 years ago if you had a few million dollars yeah you know, you're not making a lot but you could make enough money and you could do all the filings and and still be okay but today if you want to start you might have to have a larger number of clients with larger portfolios to even be able to leave a big firm and go on your own so i i just you know something that's interesting that i saw and I thought you might find that uh, interesting as well. Another quick break, and we'll go into some meat and potatoes of the show. Section 1, The Origin of the Bible A few wandering families, poor, wretched, without education, art, or power, descendants of those who had been enslaved for 400 years, ignorant as the inhabitants of Central Africa, had just escaped from their masters to the desert of Sinai. Their leader was Moses, a man who had been raised in the family of Pharaoh and had been taught the law and mythology of Egypt. For the purpose of controlling his followers, he pretended that he was instructed and assisted by Jehovah, the god of these wanderers. Everything that happened was attributed to the interference of this god. Moses declared that he met this god face to face that on Sinai's top from the hands of this god he had received the tables of stone on which, by the finger of this god, the Ten Commandments had been written, and that in addition to this, Jehovah had made known the sacrifices and ceremonies that were pleasing to him, and the laws by which the people should be governed. At that time these wanderers had no commerce with other nations. They had no written language. They could neither read nor write. They had no means by which they could make this revelation known to other nations. And so it remained buried in the jargon of a few ignorant, impoverished, and unknown tribes for more than two thousand years. Many centuries after Moses the leader was dead, many centuries after all his followers had passed away, the Pentateuch was written, the work of many writers, and to give it force and authority, it was claimed that Moses was the author. We now know that the Pentateuch was not written by Moses. Towns are mentioned that were not in existence when Moses lived. Money not coined until centuries after his death, is mentioned. So many of the laws were not applicable to wanderers on the desert. Laws about agriculture, about the sacrifice of oxen, sheep, and doves, about the weaving of cloth, about ornaments of gold and silver, about the cultivation of land, about harvest, about the threshing of grain, about houses and temples, about cities of refuge, and about many other subjects of no possible application to a few starving wanderers over the sands and rocks. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. Okay, everybody, it's party time. I have Robin Blumner, and she is, I think, Robin, is it Executive Director of Center for Inquiry? Well, my exact title is CEO of Center C for Inquiry and Executive Director of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. Excellent. Someone's so awesome. She has two titles. I like that. And that's a, a consequence of CFI merging with yeah. the Richard Dawkins Foundation in 2017. Fantastic, fantastic. We have 
wonderful things to talk about. Um, but I just reminded myself by looking at your website. So let's just start with this. Um, of course, anyone who wants to can go to Center for Inquiry, all one word, dot org and learn more about the Center for Inquiry. Talk to me about CVS and homeopathy. What's going on there? So homeopathy is one of the greatest medical frauds perpetrated on a gullible public. It it cannot work um, under the the theory of homeopathy. Um, water has a memory, and the more diluted an active substance is, the more powerful it becomes. With both of which are nonsense. Nonetheless, homeopathy is a $3 billion enterprise in the United States on an annual basis. And uh, no one really has come up against this massive consumer fraud um, on a sustained basis. And we thought it's time for someone to do that. So the Center for Inquiry has filed suit against both CVS and Walmart for the way they market homeopathic products, which is to put them right alongside science-based medicine in the pharmacy aisles under, um, under signage that says things like cold and flu, so that a consumer going to these uh, pharmacy shelves would be easily confused as to whether or not homeopathic products are evidence-based medicine or whether they're just um, sugar pills. Yeah, and I think one of the other things that was really brilliant about the original filing, uh, these uh, companies, CVS and Walmart in this case, also promote, advertise, put in their circulars, flyers, whatever, coupons, uh, all this homeopathic stuff on the same pages as actual medically valid uh, products. They do. They purposely uh, confuse consumers into thinking that they're selling legitimate medicine. And we are, are deeply concerned about it. And I think the regulatory agencies like the FDA and the FTC should be more concerned about it. But unfortunately, they haven't done much to crack down on this fraud. So we brought suit in DC under a DC consumer protection law that is quite unique across the country. It allows nonprofit organizations that promote consumer protection to stand as um, as attorneys general. In other words, we are because an attorney general has too much on his or her plate organizations can step in and bring suits on behalf of consumers gen generally. And so that's what we did. Uh, we so far have not been particularly successful. Uh, and it, our initial attempt was not accepted by the lower court in DC. Um, we have to firm up our credentials as a consumer protection organization, even though CFI has been protecting consumers from fraud and con men uh, for 40 years. Uh, and we also have to uh, get the courts to understand the danger of confusing the public with these sugar pills. Yeah. So, you know, you, these are these are things um, sold under the Latin names, such as acylicoxium. I mean, you, you look at acylicoxium, a box that reads very much like real cold and flu medicine. And there's no, almost no way to know that the, whatever active ingredient is supposed to be in it is, comes from the liver of a duck. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. But it's diluted to such a point that it's not. There, there probably is not a molecule of duck liver remaining in the product. I think the product that you're alluding to uh, is at the factor of 300x, which means a, a dilution factor of 300. And when I say 300, that means 300 zeros. So, And what consumer is going to know that? when <laughs> If you see something like 300x on a box. That's the strength, man. That's how strong it is. Of course, you are going to think it's potency and not dilution. It's not just XL. It's 300XL, 
right? It's extra large, extra strong. Um, but that basically means uh, to dilute a molecule or a, a drop of water to 300x, you would need a space of water, a volume of water bigger than the known universe. It's Yeah, it, it's absurd, right? <laughs> it's absurd. And it, it's such a blatant... Um, attempt to make profits yeah. on the on the gullibility of consumers. And, and some of the stuff, I, it's almost, I could see the argument for buyer beware. You know, if you have a cough and you buy something that's homeopathic and it's never going to help, it actually might help your cough if it has honey or it, it's something in your mouth so you don't cough or it produces saliva so you don't have dry mouth. Accidentally, it might work. Whatever. I, I'm almost okay with that. But then you get into things that are... Uh, eardrops for children that cannot work might actually make the situation worse and really tragically prolong the amount of time between the child getting ill and the parents taking them to a doctor. So an infected ear could become a very serious problem and we're screwing around with people's health. Yes. And, and at one point CVS was selling a product under their branding called asthma care. Ooh. which was uh, ostensibly a, an asthma treatment that was homeopathic. When we started raising questions about that, suddenly the box became respia care instead. Oh, and, because... now, and now uh, when I search for that, I don't think you can even buy it. But for who knows how long, uh, homeopathic asthma medicine was on the market. And recently... As recently as this summer, you know, the former head of HUD, Ben Carson, was promoting a homeopathic remedy for COVID. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me, I guess. But wow, absolutely yeah. staggering. So the, the suit is still ongoing? Yes, we, we have appealed our um, denied uh, uh, complaint. Yeah, And so we are in the appellate courts in Washington, D.C., and hopefully we'll get a good ruling. And if we don't, we will persevere in other ways. We have not stopped. We are going now to, um, to pharmacist trade associations to try to get them to acknowledge that any pharmacist that promotes, sells, or approves of a homeopathic product is violating their professional ethics. Oh, I would love that. So if uh, anything changes, please let me know and we can have you back for an update on that specific thing. Uh, forgive me for moving along because we have so many fun things to talk about. Um, the listeners can't see, but they can hear. I'm typing on the jewel box, jewel case. You remember CDs, Robin? Do you remember? I was such a child. <laughs> They, uh, I have this CD that actually, I think you guys, yes, you guys made it, uh, see if I made it in 2004. So you were like, what, elementary school, something like that. <laughs> uh, 2004, I bought this right after it came out. It is, uh, titled Robert Green Ingersoll, and it has about the Holy Bible and why I am, why am I agnostic uh, two complete works of Ingersoll performed in our time. And you guys uh, hired a professional Shakespearean actor to read this stuff in the style of Robert Green Ingersoll from, uh, what, like the 1880s, 1890s? Yes, he died in 1899, so, so no later it, than that. <laughs> he, he couldn't have performed after that. Well, maybe he could have. But, um, yeah, this, this is fantastic, and uh, I'm going to tell the listeners that I might play a few samples of this at the end of this show and maybe in the next couple of shows just to kind of tease everybody. And and one of the things that uh, kind of prompted me reaching you was to see if you guys had any more. And apparently you have a couple handfuls of CDs still. We still have a few. We still have a few. And, and, they are, and we they're available for sale, certainly. Excellent. Well, when you get a link to it, because the link that I found was broken, when you get a, a link... I will add it in the show notes or maybe even in my closing commentary for this episode. So if you give me a link for it, I can send people. So if you are somebody who still wants to buy a big plastic box with a metallic CD inside of it, uh, there are some left. But hopefully 
you're going to make the uh, MP3s available at some point if you can? Yes, Phil, upon your urging. <laughs> upon we, will, my... we will look into uh, providing uh, the option of a digital download for this CD. I, I think it's a great idea, actually. Thank you for... Uh, dusting this off and, <laughs> well, and bringing it back to life. I don't. I don't even know what what hit me. I must have seen something or heard something, and I was like, I think I have this disc of Robert Green Ingersoll stuff, and I couldn't find it. And I found out that I had actually ripped it a decade ago. It was on my computer, and then I found the jewel box, a genuine jewel box, right here. You can hear it. It's real. Uh, there's my evidence. Yeah, people should uh, go get a copy of this. Absolutely fantastic, and thank you. And uh, I think Tom Flynn had involvement with this back in 04. Making, yes, Tom, making... Flynn, Tom Flynn is a national treasure, and he is the re repository of all things Robert Greene Ingersoll. Absolutely. He's a walking encyclopedia about uh, Robert Greene Ingersoll's life and the uh, impact of... Mr. Ingersoll on the world. And he is also the founder and curator of the Robert Green Ingersoll Birthplace Museum in Dresden, New York. We have owned that property for 25 years and uh, we are very close to having it permanently endowed so that there won't be a time going forward when the memory of Ingersoll isn't pres preserved. And, and of course, that facility, due to COVID regulations, is currently closed, but uh, people can go see it. And, and is it the childhood home, the birthplace? What, what's the designation there? It is the birthplace museum. This is where Robert Green Ingersoll was born. Um, it, but it, of course, it has uh, the, the entire arc of his life presented in various exhibits within the house. So including a recording of his actual voice by Thomas Alva Edison. I, I've heard those recordings because those are somewhere on your website. People can go find those. Scratchy, if I may say, scratchy as fuck, but the, it was a long time, 120, 130, 100 something years ago. It is amazing to think that most of my listeners will have no idea who Robert Green Ingersoll is, and I will go implore them to Google his name and find information about him. Just think of the level of notoriety that you had to have that Thomas Edison said, one of the very first recordings I ever want to make of this technology of permanently capturing a voice is your voice, Mr. Ingersoll. That tells you a lot about the influence he had 120 years ago and he's not taught he's not brought up because he was incredibly against the stupidity of the bible and religion and that is what these recordings reveal and why i adore them he was the most sought after orator in the late 19th century in america he was extremely well known his lectures were sold out standing room only events and he was also um, extremely well connected when he lived in Washington DC it was not unusual for members of Congress and even members of the executive branch all the way up to the president to uh, to, to be in his home yeah to, and and socialize with him it's just absolutely amazing and, and i think it's kind of like thomas Paine, kind of gets carved out of history because of their positions on the most sacred and the most delicate thing religion absolutely i think thomas Paine is an excellent corollary i also think uh, matilda jocelyn gage uh, gets written out of the women's rights movement, the suffrage movement, because of her antipathy yeah. toward religion. And this is just a theme in, in the people that we, we lionize. Uh, if they had been critics of organized faith in any way, then they get become persona non grata, they become canceled. Yeah, yeah fair, fair <laughs> enough. It, it's a repeating pattern of uh, religion to promote things that are um, bad. 
bad things, <laughs> slavery, well, oppression of yeah. women, uh, civil rights, and they fight against them, fight against them, fight against them. And then there are people, some secular, some who are religious that have clearer heads and move us forward, always forward. And then once we start taking steps forward, religion steps back in and says, we did this. <laughs> and, and you may have had some of your members participating in this progress, but many of them fought the progress and that is quickly put under the rug and forgotten. And it's so shameful. The, also, I think part of the problem is that religions have longstanding institutions to protect the legacy of their leaders and, and their narrative of history. And, you know, the atheists, agnostics, non-believers, free thinkers, we really haven't had that. Right. And as a result, some of our great heroes get lost to history. But Robert Greene Ingersoll's name was recently uh, revived in a very important and solemn occasion uh, at the uh, memorial of the Capitol Police officer who died during the January 6th insurrection, uh, William Billy Evans. And it was President Biden who actually quoted from Robert Greene Ingersoll. And he used a p part of one of Ingersoll's poems that was also read upon the death of Biden's eldest son, Bo Biden, in 2015. And it was, I'll just read the one sentence here. It said, uh, Biden said at the memorial, when will defies fear, when duty throws the gauntlet down to fate, when honor scorns compromise with death, this is heroism. Wow. Wow. I, I don't know how he did that without losing it, because you, you almost got me in tears just thinking about uh, uh, this officer that gave his life and uh, Bo Biden, of course. But, uh, OK, I'm not going to break. You're not going to get me, Robin. I'm going to move not, on to some. Not this time, <laughs> Bill, but I'll get you. Some, some other fun stuff. Uh, you guys are doing like uh, webcasts, webinars. What what are we calling this? Yeah. Webinars, I think, is, is probably the right way to. Yeah. Put it. Um, so we typically every year put on the SciCon conference in Las Vegas. Right. Bill, I know you've, you've been to them. Uh, they're fantastic events. They bring together uh, leaders, thought leaders in skepticism and, uh, and secularism for a crowd of, of 700 plus people. Uh, but of course, COVID changed our world. And we quickly pivoted to, rather than doing what some organizations did, which was to put on an annual all-day digital conference, to instead cherry-pick our wonderful speakers over the course of the year um, and, and present them every two weeks in the form of a one-hour webinar hosted by the wonderful, funny, personable uh, Leanne Lord. And so the, we, we just had a, um, a terrific webinar with Jeff Hawkins about his new theory of intelligence, which is how your brain understands the world. I mean, he, Jeff Hawkins, who is a, a newer a neuroscientist and um, works with Silicon Valley types and is one himself, um, has been studying the neocortex and how it exactly it functions. And he has come to some groundbreaking new uh, understandings of this process. And he helped lay people through one hour of, of um, slides and descriptions to understand this new way of, of appreciating the way we experience the world yeah it was and it was, actually how all animals do this is not just something right. that is limited to to humans now is this uh, going to be saved and available somewhere on the website yes so um it's available now uh there are, if you go to skepticalinquire.org slash presents you can see uh, Jeff Hawkins' presentation. It's, in, it's on video. And then all of the 
previous presentations that this series has, series has offered. The one prior to Jeff's was um, John Cook, who talks about how to counter science misinformation, which of course is incredibly time, timely oh, yeah. right now, yeah. uh, and how to gamify the idea of science misinformation. In other words, make it less challenging for people to, to question their own beliefs. I like it. Uh, th yeah, through gaming, through making it fun or funny, uh, that lowers people's resistance to seeing things cl more clearly than they would otherwise. That's interesting. I, I'm going to have to go back and watch that because I missed it because uh, the gamification of investing, I see as a net negative on people's lives uh, so I would love to see something where gamification is used for an educational purpose and I just want to throw in uh, for those who don't know Jeff Hawkins uh, was the founder of Palm uh, you may remember back in the way back time uh, Palm handheld devices uh, he is one of the founders of modern technology of uh, cell phones and cell phone networks and computers so um, absolutely amazing presentation and we don't know exactly what date people are going to hear this, but what are some upcoming talks that you have planned? The next one we have coming is on Thursday, April 29th. It's called Escaping the Rabbit Hole, How to Help Your Conspiracy Theorist Friend, featuring Mick West. So uh, it, it's how to get those who are already down the rabbit hole to see the light of day. I mean, we're really focusing a lot on that right. uh, these days because there's so much conspiracy theory oh, thinking. Boy. There's so much denial of, of facts and logic. Uh, and, and what is CFI about but promoting reality? It, we're in, trying to inoculate people from this kind of misinformation and wrongheaded thinking. So <clears throat> the best way to do the best way to respond to that is to find experts who have studied the problem and are able to talk about the best techniques for for getting people out of the rabbit hole. I like it. I like it a lot. And like you said, CFI is perfectly positioned. Um, the big problem that uh, logic and reason and science might have is they can't make so much money selling homeopathy. Oh, wait. Could you guys actually sell homeopathic products? Wouldn't that be neat to make money selling that stuff to then fight it? Ooh. That's... I don't know if we're going to put you on the development <laughs> committee, Phil. <laughs> well, it's just like uh, years ago, I had suggested to another group that they should publish their own version of the Bible. And they should actually print a copyrighted version and make the previous printers sue them for copyright infringement because it was their version making it officially a court argument that the bible was not original but was their creation that's the only way they can protect their printing rights but but anyway i digress um hmm, maybe well, you know one of the things that uh, you're bringing up a good point which is that we are really outgunned yeah you no know, the, the religious right and conspiracy theorists have this, this virtually unlimited access to resources. Right. And that those of us in the reason and science community, uh, we're, you know, we're fighting with, with pennies when they're fighting with millions of dollars. Um, it, it's pretty sad that there, there just seems to be the a willingness on the part of our, our opponents to reach into their pockets and support this this nonsense, and for those of us fighting for truth and reason, um, you know, th th there are a lot of other good causes that people feel they ha they should be giving to first. And, right. And so I, I I think if you added up the all of the big guns in the secular movement, so if you included us, CFI, but also like FFRF and the American Humanist Association and American Atheists, if you put us all together, I'd be surprised if you came up with a $20 million annual uh, revenue yeah, stream. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure that's not the case. Or I'm sure I'm sure you're correct. I, I don't know. English but if you, if you look at uh, organizations like um, 
focus on the family uh, <laughs> or the Family Research Center or uh, Alliance Defending Freedom. Those are the, the that's the legal arm of the religious right, or I should these days say the Christian nationalist yeah. uh, movement. Uh, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of millions hundreds of dollars of all told. And so what I'm okay. going to suggest people do, of course, go learn more about Center for Inquiry at, at Center for Inquiry dot org. And again, the page is in beautiful Illini, University of Illinois colors, blue and orange, orange and blue. Uh, but at the top right is a beautifully bright orange donate button. And if I can paraphrase uh, Ghostbusters, uh, no donation is too small. No donation is too big. How's that sound? That sounds great to me. Thank you so much, Bill, for for that pitch. We really appreciate it. And for all you do, because I love your podcast. Not a problem. Any other things, big things going on that people should know about that I've not yet brought up? Oh, yes. We, we I mean, we're a mer- many-headed hydra. And uh, CFI has just an incredible array of, of important and impactful programs, including our TIES program. So that's the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. And that's uh, a, a program that teaches middle school science teachers how to teach evolution. Nice. Because so many middle school science teachers don't have the knowledge or the tools or even the confidence to teach evolution and to answer its critics. And we do, well, for a long time we did on the ground, in person um, tutorials for these teachers and giving them all the tools they need to teach evolution to their students. So, you know, you do one of these and you, you're going to help generations of students because you're teaching the teachers. These days, all of that is online. And the TIES program, you know, go, go to a, the website, just Google TIES or the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. And there's, uh, you know, off the shelf curriculum, labs, tests, anything a teacher could possibly want. And also you, we can do webinars specifically for teacher development in your district. So if there are teachers out there listening, contact us. We'd be happy to do a webinar for your science teachers in your district. The other thing we do, which I think is so important around the world, is something called our Openly Secular Campaign. I'm sorry. Uh, openly Secular is important, but that's not our around the world um, effort. It's our secular rescue program. Yeah, I was just looking at that. Yeah, so secular rescue was the result of the devastating literal on the street executions of atheist writers and bloggers in Bangladesh in 2014 and 2015. We lost a good friend to Reason and Science and CFI in particular, Avijit Roy, to uh, to attacks by Islamic extremists in Bangladesh. And he was just one of more than a dozen um, targeted atheists in that country around that time. So Secular Rescue was born out of that necessity. We, it's a fund. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty well-resourced fund. Thank you to donors and specifically uh, to the Frank Ro- Robinson Foundation. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, that helps people escape violence, threats of violence, and threats of criminal prosecution for their atheist activism in countries around the world. We find that primarily in Muslim dominated countries, that's where our, where our work is, is located. We have two um, halftime staffers who work to evaluate the claims that come in, the requests that come in and provide resources when, when we can. We help about 120 people a year, most of those We're not helping them escape necessarily a bad situation. Sometimes we're providing letters for asylum claims. Sometimes we're helping them find legal counsel. Sometimes we're just helping them provide to to find resources for, you know, to to apply for scholarships overseas or to find mental health resources or a community to talk to. But a handful of people every year, we do help them escape 
a dangerous situation with them and their families. And so it's literally a lifesaver. And it's been called the Underground Railroad for Atheists. I like it. So much stuff here. Uh, everybody, you can go to centerforinquiry.org. Of course, if you uh, click on the little hamburger, I think is what we're calling it now, uh, maybe veggie burger, uh, you can see one of the options as programs. Of course, you can go donate. Uh, Robin, how can people reach you if they would like to interview you for their show or maybe have you come to a conference when we meet in the human world again? I can be reached at my email address, which is rblumner at centerforinquiry.org. And it's Center for Inquiry all typed out. All typed out. Excellent. Well, Robin, thank you so much for spending your precious time with us and teaching us so much about what you guys do. And of course, I look doubly forward to the Robert Greene Ingersoll MP3 files. As soon as you have that available, link me and we'll get to some people to buy and or download or whatever. Thank you, Phil. It was an absolute pleasure. It is now not only admitted by intelligent and honest theologians that Moses was not the author of the Pentateuch, but they all admit that no one knows who the authors were or who wrote any of these books or a chapter or a line. We know that the books were not written in the same generation, that they were not all written by one person, that they are filled with mistakes and contradictions. It is also admitted that Joshua did not write the book that bears his name, because it refers to events that did not happen until long after his death. No one knows or pretends to know the author of Judges. All we know is that it was written centuries after all the Judges had ceased to exist. No one knows the author of Ruth, nor of First and Second Samuel, all we know is that Samuel did not write the books that bear his name. In the 25th chapter of 1 Samuel is an account of the raising of Samuel by the witch of Endor. No one knows the author of First and Second Kings or First and Second Chronicles. All we know is that these books are of no value. We know that the Psalms were not written by David. In the Psalms, the captivity is spoken of. And that did not happen until about 500 years after David slept with his fathers. We know that Solomon did not write the Proverbs or the Song, that Isaiah was not the author of the book that bears his name, that no one knows the author of Job, Ecclesiastes, or Esther, or of any book in the Old Testament with the exception of Ezra. We know that God is not mentioned or in any way referred to in the book of Esther. We know, too, that the book is cruel absurd and impossible. God is not mentioned in the Song of Solomon, the best book in the Old Testament, and we know that Ecclesiastes was written by an unbeliever. We know, too, that the Jews themselves had not decided as to what books were inspired or authentic until the second century after Christ. We know that the idea of inspiration was of slow growth and that the inspiration was determined by those who had certain ends to accomplish. You're listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. I'm so delighted that you're still here. Thank you for listening to the show. I'm sure you had fun listening. I know I have a lot of fun making it. It is some time-consuming work, but I actually quite like it. I just wish I had more hours <laughs> in the average day. Uh, Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash phil, and you can become a supporter, sustainer, subscriber, supporter, patron. You can become a patron as little as $1 per episode. And again, because sometimes I skip a week or two, so I don't want to charge you weekly or monthly. It's by episode. So the starting contribution level is $1. The top one, you want to be a rock star, is $6.66 per episode. And of course, I'd be happy to have you. As you know, we talked earlier to Robin Blumner. She is the president and CEO of Center for Inquiry. We talked about the Robert Greene Ingersoll CD. And the thing that is just so amazing is just a couple of minutes ago, right before I was recording this tailing segment, and now, of course, I have to go mix the whole podcast, but she just sent me the information uh, about the CD, and it is now on the Center for Inquiry store. And 
It's a long link. <laughs> so what are you going to do? Um, it's centerforinquiry.org slash store slash product slash two dash CD dash set. Okay, it goes on. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But if you go to Center for Inquiry and you go to the store, and maybe if there's a cool search function, you can find it. I will put the direct link to the CD in the show notes, and I'm also going to share it on my personal and the Polaris Facebook pages, so you can go look there if you want. They're only asking for $12. I kind of figured it'd be more, but it's $12. It's pretty close to two hours, if I recall correctly, of Robert Green Ingersoll. And of course, it covers two of his more famous and relevant topics, uh, relevant to uh, the topics of this show and what CFI does. Uh, one is about the Bible, which I had um, last week, I had the introduction, and this week I have part one, and I broke it up into subparts <laughs> one and two uh, because they were two minutes each that way instead of being four minutes. So again, if you like that, let me know. If you want, you can go buy the CD at the Center for Inquiry store. And uh, Robin was kind enough to tell me that they are working on making the audio-only version, like MP3s, available somehow, somewhere. I don't know if that'll be on Amazon or Bandcamp or or what. Uh, as soon as I find that out, I'll, I'll let you know. And you can uh, listen to this while you're traveling. And if you have some uh, friends in your car, you're going on a long trip, you've got a couple hours to kill. Maybe they can learn something about the Bible. So hope you enjoy all of that. Uh, real quick note on solar panels, just to give you updates for those who are interested, curious. My billing month that ended April 7th, I only had to pay about $9 for electricity. Well, $9 on top of the fixed fees for the service and the connection and the meter charge and that stuff, but $9 for the electricity that I used. And since then, it's just gotten better. Uh, a few sunny days create a ginormous <laughs> amount of electricity. Even cloudy rainy days create a reasonable amount of electricity. I have every expectation that for the next six, maybe even seven months, uh, the system will create more electricity than I use. And hopefully, because of the way I've got it set up with um, the hourly billing and the net metering and everything with my local utility provider, those extra credits will roll over and I'll still be not, not paying for electricity in October, November, December, January, maybe even all 12 months. I, if I understand correctly for my provider, on or around April 1st, they zero everything out. And so you don't want to have a system that's so big it makes credits uh, because you'll never be able to enjoy them. So you have to get the balance right on this. Uh, your area may be so totally different that this idea doesn't really work for you, but check it out. If you're interested, uh, kind of a nice thing to do. And of course, my system not only covers my house, and we use way more than the average neighbor in general inside the house, but I have a EV, a BEV, battery electric vehicle, my Chevy Bolt. And we also have what's called a PHEV, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle for the RAV4 Prime. My electric usage includes charging both of those vehicles on a regular basis. So not only am I basically paying nothing net after buying the solar panel system, um, net nothing monthly for all of the electricity for the house, I'm paying net nothing to fuel my two cars. So that is fucking cool. And uh, maybe a future topic. If anyone has great links or videos to this, I could do some more research on uh, one of the ideas that I don't know who, who creates these things, but uh, there's a memes and ideas going around that if everyone switched to electric uh, cars, then our system would break. Well, of course, if that happened tomorrow, that might be true, but they're not counting all the ways we stop using energy like uh, pumping oil out of the ground, uh, transferring oil to a refinery refining the oil into its component parts and creating gasoline and kerosene and all the other uh, things that come out of it takes an enormous amount of energy. And then, of course, distributing that oil to your gas station and then you going and getting the, the, sorry, the gasoline to the gas station. 
So there's a lot of steps of lost energy and energy consumption, giant energy consumption in the creation, the mining, the drilling, the all the things we do to get gasoline and other energy sources that come from oil. And if those are reduced, a lot of that electricity or energy could be used in providing it to the electrical grid. And of course, the electrical grid might need some beefing up and building out. But most people, most of the time, can charge overnight. And for some electrical grids, uh, energy is wasted or lost because you can't just turn off and turn back on a coal power plant or a nuclear plant. And wind turbines spin when there's wind. And so if you're using energy that's excess at night, it may not even need to change anything in the system for many years. But if people put in solar panels or if you have some land, a wind turbine, uh, charge your cars overnight, and then some improvements in the uh, electrical grid over the next 10 years, 20 years, because even if every car purchased my fantasy every car is purchased in as little as 10 years from now is electric you still have cars that will stay on the road for another 5 10 15 or longer years Uh, so we have time we can think about this we can plan for this and make it happen the question is is the world a better place if more and more of our cars run on electricity and if more and more of that electricity is provided from places like wind or tidal energy Uh, solar, some other source. But anyway, I digress. So I'll keep you posted from time to time on the solar power experiment on my house. But so far, it's going well. And I now forecast that on an annual basis, uh, excluding the fixed cost, my electric bills will be pretty much zero. So that's kind of cool. Thank you for listening to the show. And I hope to see you somewhere soon out in the real world after we get past the COVID. And until then, ciao.